In this video, we're going to cover the late 18th and 19th centuries. To contextualize this lecture, we're going to start with the Industrial Revolution in 1760. And products like textiles, iron, and steel became industrialized. This means that they were able to be produced on a mass scale very efficiently. For instance, textiles were created in weaving mills. Advancing iron and steel manufacturing led to a revolution in architecture such that people could now start to create skyscrapers. Moving on to 1776, we see the American Revolution, which implemented ideas of enlightenment in government and in public life. Building on this momentum, we see the French Revolution in 1789, during which the French broke away from the traditional system of patronage. So instead of having one person or one group of people controlling the styles, there was a lot of freedom to have multiple styles develop. By the late 18th century, we're moving on to the Enlightenment and Age of Reason, during which there's a shift to rational and scientific thinking as it's applied to religious, political, social, and economic issues. And it also focused on the importance of individualized liberty, self-determination, and progress. As a result, this renewed interest in democracy and other secular concerns. Now that we're oriented, the first period we're going to talk about is neoclassicism. As its name suggests, it's basically the new classical. Artists are striving to emulate classical Greek and Roman techniques in addition to their themes and subject matter. And this was done primarily because Rome was a symbol of republican or non-hereditary government, which in light of all of these revolutions was very relatable at the time. And some of these themes were a readiness to die for liberty, revolution itself, and decisions led by rationality. Formally, artists are also emulating this time period through rational and geometric compositions, as well as utilizing a strong side light to emphasize figures in the foreground. In doing this, they were trying to mirror the aesthetic of classical relief sculptures. We can see evidence of most of these conventions in this example from 1784. During this time period, women were believed to be consumed by emotions and thus unfit for public life. Even the example that we just looked at, women were used in the background as emotional reactions to the foreground subject matter. They were more so visual tropes than subjects themselves. Women were also excluded from the academy. So for them to receive training to become artists, they would either need to be very wealthy and receive private training, or the woman needs to be in a family that has an artist in it. Commonly, the situation is a daughter learning from her father. One such female artist was Angelica Kaufman. Just by becoming an artist in and of itself, she overcame these obstacles. And in doing so, she was able to depict the perspective of women at the time, which obviously, due to the situation, was not very common. She often featured women who were actively practicing being artists which goes against the time period a bit because women are active roles in her paintings, but also they're fulfilling a role in a career that is not really offered to them. In 1770, she was actually elected to be a full member of the British Royal Academy. Next we have Romanticism, which is what followed the Enlightenment and focused more on emotions and personal expression rather than rationality. And while Romanticism did address themes of individual liberty very similarly to Neoclassicism, it did it in a different way, because Romantic artists saw imagination and emotion as far more valuable than reason. Romantics did believe that human beings were naturally good, but they had far less faith in human society, seeing it as a form of corruption, whereas nature was a form of purity and truth. Romantics also wanted to depict current contemporary topics, which was again a diversion from the neoclassical looking backwards at old myths. However, looking at their love of expression and emotion, they did often take liberties with the facts of the event in order to create a more expressive depiction of the scene itself. To further illustrate these emotive qualities, the artist would often use loose and open brushwork, almost as if it was an artifact of the artist's dramatic movement when creating the work itself. And this was called a painterly approach, which we can see in these two paintings by Turner. Photography as a medium helped to bridge the gap between Romanticism and Realism. In the mid-1800s, we see early landscape photography developing. Artists like Timothy O'Sullivan helped Americans to learn more about the territories of the West. 
And while this land is not new in any way and definitely belonged to indigenous people, it was new to the people that were seeing these photographs. Utilizing the eye of the artist for each photo, it was meant to entice people to expand into the West. Beyond photographing the landscape, photographers were also utilizing new techniques, such as artificial lighting and unique compositions, with artistic use of posing, drapery, and specific settings. Because cameras were able to document exactly what was in front of them, it freed painters and other artists to do more than just document or illustrate. Realism is defined as such because of both the techniques used and the subject matter. Instead of focusing on idealism or nostalgia, it really honed in on the ordinary and the mundane. In previous examples, we saw grand myths or giant overwhelming landscapes. But in images like the one that we see here, it's just a tender moment between ordinary people. Realist artists like Henry Ossola Tanner wanted to venerate these moments. And Tanner himself was the first internationally famous African-American painter. He moved from the United States to Paris to face less discrimination, and he was both a realist and an impressionist. In the 1850s, we see a revival of realism with Gustave Courbet. And he sought to give dignity to the ordinary through very direct yet painterly approaches. As we can see in this example, the image is beautiful, it has great technique, and it's very expressive. But these are just ordinary working class people, as reflected in the title, The Stonebreakers. For artists, embracing realism was a total rejection of the romantic and neoclassical formulas and conventions. As a result, critics saw realism as crude, inartistic, and socialistic. But Courbet responded to critics saying, show me an angel and I'll paint one. Artists wanted to depict the life around them, not a mythology or something from the past. Academic art is basically just art approved by the academy. In general, academic art follows tradition-minded themes, as well as overused formulas laid out by a certain academy or school. Unless someone is talking about art education and institutions in general, quote, the academy is going to refer to the French Academy of the 19th century. And this institution played a major role in salons, which were huge annual art exhibitions that showed the artists of the time. Participating in the French salon was basically the only way that an artist could become known to the public. Later in the 19th century, artists were rebelling against the academy, its conventions, and its power in the art world. As a result of this shift, artists were discovered and became known in different settings. The images here are great examples of this shift. The top painting exemplifies the Academy's concerns. The artist is a scholar, reflecting on the sculpture process through mythology. Yet in the bottom painting, the artist is way back in the corner in the dark, and the models in the foreground, and it shows more the real labor of sculpting rather than romanticizing the process. One artist who was instrumental in the rebellion against the Academy was Manet. He utilized realism, traditional painting techniques, and flattened figures, which he borrowed from Japanese printmaking, in addition to loose and open brushwork, which inspired his younger contemporaries who ended up leading the Impressionist movement. The work that we see here, Luncheon on the Grass, was majorly scandalized by the Academy, the public, and critics. This is because it featured a female nude with clothed men. And while nude female figures are seen throughout art history, this is one of the first instances in Western art where a woman is not used as a symbol or an allegory. Instead, she's just a normal woman, which inherently sexualized her for most of the viewers. Manet's making an even more direct punch at this convention by comparing the woman in the front who's just sitting among these men with the figure in the back, who's following a more traditional pose of both ignoring the viewer and engaging with a symbolic substance like water. However, this front figure is far more engaged with the viewer with direct eye contact. The Impressionists began to show their work because they were rejected from the 1873 Salon and created their own exhibition of their work the following year. Like the Realists, the Impressionists opposed academic doctrines in favor of depicting the contemporary world around them, affirming modern life and seeking to capture the beauty of the world in individual moments. However, unlike the realists, they were largely optimistic and hopeful about the promise of new advances within human-made society, in addition to nature, not in lieu of it. As their name suggests, these artists aim to capture the impressions of moments, 
painting what the eye sees and experiences directly, not what the mind knows or interprets. The Impressionists had advanced knowledge about light, acknowledging that it is a complex of reflections received and perceived by the human eye before being reassembled by the mind, forming a visual and conceptual understanding of the subject. In order to capture this within paint, they utilized small dabs of color that were identifiable as individual strokes of paint up close, but when the viewer backed away or before they even approached it, the image would have lots of color dimension looking bright and lively. Some Impressionists borrowed from Turner's painterly techniques, but used it in a more objective and less emotional manner. Impressionism was not confined to painting. Sculptures also utilized rough and expressive finishes similar to the emotive quality of a painterly approach with visible brushstrokes. August Rodin's The Thinker is a great example of Impressionist sculpture. While he primarily modeled his works in plaster and clay, they were later cast in bronze, which created the final sculpture. The thinker is a representation of an artist themselves, as they're struggling between creator, judge, and witness, brooding over the human condition in itself. Rodin's work restored sculpture as a vehicle for personal expression, pulling it out of the context of merely decoration or monument. Moving on now to post-impressionism, which we see starting around 1885. As its name dictates, it directly followed impressionism both building on and reacting to the movement. That said, there was no singular style. The artists were reacting in very different ways. Some artists leaned toward more clear and formal organization, while others focused more on their personal expression within the piece. One artist, Georges Seurat, pioneered the technique of pointillism, which creates solid forms and images using only dots of color. As a process, it relies on optical color mixing, which, as the name suggests, means that our eyes are going to mix these colors that are close together, combining them to create different vibrant surfaces. We can see evidence of this in the two examples here, the top being from farther away and the bottom being much closer to the painting. In the top, we see lots of dimensional vibrant colors, but in the bottom, we can identify each individual dot of color that the artist applied to create this effect. Cezanne was another post-impressionist who played with perspective and relationships in space. He would emphasize the solidity of a form, utilizing broad strokes of color. In doing this, he was very interested in landscape painting. He often utilized both warm and cool color schemes, using the warm colors to advance forward toward the viewer and the cool colors to recede backwards giving the impression of air and depth, as well as the illusion of atmospheric perspective. Frequently, he simplified forms like houses and trees into just patches of color, abstracting them into almost geometric planes and masses while still exploring the depth of the space. Post-Impressionists diverged from the more formalist ideals and techniques to focus more on making the artist's thoughts and feelings visible. Paul Gauguin was one artist doing just this. As a result of the industrial society surrounding him, he was very critical of materialism, utilizing symbols to actively critique this. He often punctuated his messages with very simple yet vibrantly colored backgrounds and juxtaposed this with the flat figures in the foreground. Often his figures had minimal shadows or none at all, and these were techniques that he picked up from observing Japanese prints. In the example that we see here, the image was obviously not observed, or perceived, but instead came from the artist's mind and conception of the story. Van Gogh sought to capture the inner expression of the heart as it responds to different events. In doing so, he utilized the potential of open brushwork and relatively pure colors. He also sought to intensify the surface of his paintings by using a technique called impasto, which utilizes very thick brushwork to create dimension and texture on the surface of a painting. In doing this, the viewer can see each gesture that the artist made to create each mark. It also fosters a strong sense of rhythmic movement throughout all of his paintings, which is particularly evident in the Starry Night that we see here. Like several of the other artists that we've discussed, Van Gogh studied and applied techniques that he saw in Japanese printmaking, primarily in reference to composition. In 1885, we see the emergence of symbolism which was a movement in both literature and the arts. 
Thematically, it aimed to lift the mind of the viewer from the mundane to the practical, and it often utilized decorative forms and symbols that were intentionally vague or open-ended. In utilizing these sorts of elements, they were able to create imaginative suggestions from which the viewer could deduce their own meaning. As a result, symbolism had a major influence on surrealism. Additionally, its exploration of both line and color had major influence on Art Nouveau architecture and interior design. So what? Why does any of this matter? Well, for one, we're able to track different time periods and concerns of those time periods through the art and what it represents. Particularly in conversations surrounding the academy, we can see what was funded institutionally, and that shows major cultural concerns. Or considering rebellion against an academy, and what that means. It's interesting to see time cycle, so we're going from logic back to emotions, back to logic again, and especially how that interacts with the way that women are treated and included, or more accurately, excluded. Because women were too emotional for the neoclassical and its rationality, but why were they not then the superstars of the very emotive and expressive romantic period? In addition, these works of art are really common in our culture because they're so recent and so famous. Oftentimes, pop culture satirizes them. For instance, the cast of The Office recreated the Sunday afternoon painting, or the countless reimaginings of The Starry Night, ranging in reference from Batman to Doctor Who, and the ever-relatable and often recreated Scream. So it's important to see where we came from and what those references mean because they're still alive and well today. And that is where I will conclude this lecture. Be sure to stay safe, get some sleep, and I will see you all in class.